So welcome to today's BU In Focus, Cultivating Inclusive Practices to Enhance Mentally Healthy School Communities. I'm Katie, and I will be co-facilitating today's In Focus with my colleague, Aislin. We're also fortunate to have with us today a great panel to share their expertise. So thank you for joining us as we explore the ways schools can create a stronger sense of inclusion and belonging for students within their communities. And now I'd like to acknowledge country. I would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as Australia's first people and traditional custodians. I value their cultures, identities and continuing connection to country, waters, kin and community. I pay my respects to elders past and present. Through Headspace and the BU framework, we are committed to making a positive contribution to the well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people by providing services that are welcoming, safe, culturally appropriate and inclusive. As an initiative with national reach, we extend our respect to all First Nations people across Australia. I'm coming to you this afternoon from the land of Lachawita, and I'd like to thank all Palawa and Mulwina people for their care of this beautiful island. And of course, I would also like to extend my greatest respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us for this webinar today. Thanks so much for that wonderful acknowledgement, Katie. Um, I am joining today from Tandanya, um, down here in SA, the lands of the Ghana people. My name is Aislinn and I am a BU consultant with the SA team. Um, my background is in social work and psychology. Um, and I was really, really excited to be a part of this in focus session today because I think that it's so important to empower educators to enter these spaces and to have the confidence to ask the questions and really engage with this sort of work. So I'm going to pass down our wonderful panel and ask everyone to introduce themselves. Katie, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. My name's Katie Lack. I'm the BU State Coordinator. I have a background in primary and secondary teaching. And today I'm really wanting to highlight the great work and the strategies that lots of schools are trying hard to do to build inclusion into their communities. And now I'd like to pass it on to Kirstine. Thanks, Katie. Um, so my name's Kirstine Hand and I'm the project coordinator of the Capa Capability, Capacity and uh, Diversity Initiative at True Relationships and Reproductive Health in Queensland. So um, my background is in education, both secondary, early childhood and special education contexts. But within my role at True, I work to support school-based staff in Queensland on how to maintain the well-being of LGBTIQ plus students. So really excited to be here today. Um, I'd now like to pass on to Meredith. Thank you, Kirstine. My name's Meredith Melville Jones. I'm the director of Bradfield Senior College, which is in St. Leonard's in Sydney. Uh, my background is, in fact, in television and the airline industry, which is completely not related to this. Uh, but um, what we pride ourselves on at, at Bradfield is having a truly diverse community, and we work very hard at it every day. And I'm really happy to share some of those strategies with you today. So, looking forward to this afternoon's webinar. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, before we dive in, I do just want to make a note for everyone on the importance of looking after yourself um, and others in the process of doing this work. So you can see on the screen there um, just a little three part um, model for looking after yourself. And I think it's really important as we're working in this diversity space to be aware that strong emotions can come up for us. Um, there is also just a note at this stage that there may be mention of loss to suicide um, in a de-identified sense later on in the presentation. So just do be sure to take care of yourself in this space. Um, if you need to step away or take a break, that's totally okay. And we also definitely encourage you to access um, any supports that you may have, be they uh, some of your, you know, helplines, lifeline, those sorts of people, or EAP through your workplace. Um, and there's also some resources, links being posted in the chat box for you to have a look at if you would like to. 
but yeah, just a note to make sure that you're looking after yourself as we're going through this webinar today. So in today's session, we'll provide you with an understanding of why inclusive practices in school communities is so important for young people. We'll also have the opportunity to hear from Kirstine and Meredith in a panel discussion where they'll respond to questions about inclusive practice from our audience. And um, we'll also focus on the actions that educators can take to increase a sense of an inclusion and belonging for young people in their communities and hope that you can take away some strategies for providing young people with early support that may be experiencing the early signs of mental health concerns. And also following today's session, as mentioned earlier, you'll get to take away a certificate which will be available via the follow up email after today's session. Yep. Um, another thing that we wanted to mention as we're moving into this, one of our last bits of housekeeping, I promise, uh, is this concept of hindsight bias. So something to be aware of is that humans are really, really good at making connections and making meaning out of information that they come across. And what can happen when we're working in spaces, particularly spaces like diversity and inclusion, is that it can lead us to a space where we start to feel uncomfortable about our past actions or our past inactions. And it's really important that if you notice that happening for you, you take a moment to remember that everyone who's here today is here because they really do genuinely care about the children and young people in their care and because they want to do the best that they possibly can. So anything that you have done in your life has come from a place of trying to do the best that you could with the information that was available to you at that time. So if you do find yourself getting caught up in could haves or should haves or shouldn't haves, just take a moment to take a step back from that and notice that that's happening and remind yourself that you really are doing such a wonderful job. Thanks, Aislinn. So we really want our pe young people to flourish, to feel included and connected in our school communities. And I think as part of a focus today, it's really important to consider the whys. So if you're wondering why we may consider implementing inclusive practices as educators, it's important to consider the impact on young people if we don't. And we know that some young people are at greater risk within our school communities and at times feel disconnected to school and their peers. So young people who experience distress and exclusion may unfortunately disengage from their learning and not attend school regularly, which also may impact on their capacity to seek help or to build positive relationships with others. This is an important consideration when we know one trusted person within a school community can have such a positive impact on a young person feeling supported and connected. Specific groups um, that may be at more risk include our LGBTQIA plus community and our First Nations youth. And just to, I guess, cover some of the stats that are behind that. Um, so the evidence that we have access to shows that um, at the moment, almost two in five young people aged 16 to 24 report a mental health condition within a sort of 12 month period. Uh, but that goes, um, that's greater for young people within those LGBTIQA plus and First Nations groups among others. Um, the reports of those very high or higher levels of psychological distress similarly go quite a lot higher. And this results in young people missing school because they don't feel safe. Um, and this is true for both of those groups that we've mentioned earlier. Um, it's really important to note that uh, those attendance rates aren't getting better over time. And like Katie mentioned, oftentimes educators really do provide that first point of contact for young people seeking support. Um, and so what we really want to be able to do is try and encourage them to be attending and be in that space so that they can access those really wonderful supports that are available to them. So going to hand over to our lovely panellist, Kirstine, who's going to talk a little bit about the work that she does now. 
Thanks very much. Um, so as was just mentioned, we know that LGBTIQ plus students do face unique challenges and unfortunately still are at a much higher risk of experiencing discrimination or bullying. Um, and of course, this is going to impact on their social emotional well being, as well as their ability to feel like they can engage safely in school, um, which of course then impacts on academic achievement. Uh, so it's really important that we're working together collectively to address this in school environments. Um, and in order to do so, it's also critical that we're drawing on research literature to make sure that the inclusive practices that we're putting into place are informed by evidence. Um, so to be effective in supporting LGBTIQ plus student wellbeing, it's really critical that schools implement a whole school approach towards LGBTIQ plus inclusion and an approach which also considers intersectionality. Um, now, by doing this, it will help to ensure that LGBTIQ plus students are very well supported and that diversity within the school environment is being embraced, respected um, and also celebrated. Now, you can see a, um, a bit of a framework there, hopefully up on the screen, uh, the whole school approach to inclusion. So there's several key components of this whole school approach that really should be considered when we're looking at embedding LGBTIQ plus inclusive practices. So you can see one of the areas there is having strong leadership. So leadership teams within the school that show a very visible um, commitment to LGBTIQ plus inclusion and wellbeing is critical. And that can be within staff leadership teams as well as um, school leaders as well from within peer groups is really important. Um, it's critical that we're establishing inclusive school values and an inclusive school culture, one where diversity is respected and where it's very clear that bullying and discrimination is not accepted within that school environment. Now, something that can be really important to help us achieve that is making sure that we've got very clear, explicit policies, procedures and processes in place where consideration of LGBTIQ plus people um, has been embedded and very explicit protections for LGBTIQ plus people are stated. Um, we move then on to inclusive curriculum, and uh, it's really critical for a number of reasons that we're embedding that LGBTIQ plus representation into curriculum. The ACARA curriculum does support that, so it is evident there in ACARA. Um, it's critical that we are embedding that representation because it helps to ensure equity of education. So making sure all students' individual needs um, and educational needs are being addressed. But we also know from the research that where we are embedding inclusive curriculum, it actually helps to remove that stigmatization that has historically existed around LGBTIQ plus identities, which then reduces the amount of um, peer bullying and discrimination that LGBTIQ plus students are likely to experience. Experience. So really, really important to make sure that we're doing that. Um, we also need to make sure that we've got resources that represent LGBTIQ plus people within our school environments and that we've got accessible facilities for LGBTIQ plus people. So that might be considerations, for example, around bathrooms or change rooms and making sure that everybody feels safe and comfortable to access the bathroom that aligns with their gender identity, for example. Now, something else that's really important is making sure that our staff are provided with appropriate training and support as well. It's particularly critical uh, around LGBTIQ plus inclusion, as it's very typical for staff to be at very different stages of their learning and understanding um, in this particular area. Um, and then we move on to student support and, um, and also very importantly, student voice. So making sure that we're listening to students um, and collecting data. So whether that's through surveys, um, providing opportunities for broader education for the whole of the student cohort as well. Um, and also something that's been found to be very beneficial, again, supported by research evidence is um, establishing LGBTIQ plus student groups as well. Uh, but this helps enable enable students to um, form connections with community, with similar peers, um, as well as get that social emotional support, um, have those strong relationships with school staff, 
um, which can also be a really pivotal um, factor to ensuring that uh, LGBTIQ plus students feel safe and supported and a sense of being connected to school. Um, and it also can play a critical part in helping to uh, improve that broader school um, culture as well around LGBTIQ plus inclusion uh, by building that awareness within the broader school community. And part of that also, finally, we come to um, the importance of engaging with our parents and carers as part of the school community and other community groups, which might also include local LGBTIQ plus organisations where relevant. Okay, so um, yeah, that's the whole school approach to LGBTIQ plus inclusion. Um, so what we do tend to find is when schools review these different areas, they might find that they're at different starting points. Um, I know I've engaged with several schools where they found that actually they were very limited in what was um, currently occurring within their school environments, but then worked through a process over a period of about 12 months. So the starting point for those schools was getting um, some professional development for their staff, uh, more detailed professional development for the key support staff, such as guidance officers, and then looking at implementing student groups, updating policies. And what's really lovely um, to see is the uh, huge amount of change and growth that can occur in schools when they do apply that whole school approach to inclusion. Now, I just want to touch briefly on a couple of resources that have been developed at Drew to assist in this space. So you can see there the Being Me animation, and this was developed for young people who might be questioning their gender or sexuality or wanting to talk to somebody about it. It helps to send that strong message that they're not alone and that there are possible supports that they will be able to access. And it can also serve as a useful conversation starter for our parents and carers and, and school staff as well. And you can also see there the set base, sorry, the safe space posters. Um, so they're available for free download and they help to signify whether a room or a school or a particular staff member is a safe um, location or person for an LGBTIQ plus person to access. Um, it's been designed deliberately so that it's suitable to be used in all school settings and it's been really lovely to see them get embraced, um, including in primary schools. I know I've gone into primary schools where those posters were up in every classroom wall. So, you know, really great thing to see because that type of visible representation is really important. It sends a very clear message of respect and inclusion uh, within school environments around that LGBT TIQ plus diversity and, and gets that message across, not just to students, but also to staff and parents and carers. So that's just a little snapshot from me. Um, I'll hand over now to Meredith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirstine. Um, and wonderful frameworks there for everybody to access. Uh, there, there is uh, so much, uh, I think, available at the moment uh, now, which is fantastic to see. So just a little bit about um, Bradfield. We are a senior high school and uh, in an adult learning environment. We are a TAFE, New South Wales Department of Education uh, co-funded agreement. Uh, we specialise in the creative industries here for students, but uh, students can do a regular academic pathway as well. Uh, around 336 full-time students, and they come from all over Sydney, so from 187 different suburbs across Sydney, with around 50-50 um, share, really, between government and non-government schools, and then some other educational offerings, such as homeschooling. So we have a very, very diverse bunch of students who arrive to us in year 11. Um, we also have 156 students who come just to do one course, such as TVET and so on. I think you can see there by the stats that we have quite a complex cohort. Around 92% have risks for disengaging in education and they can range from everything from uh, family to social to health issues. With around, I mean, very close to 50% having been bullied in their school environment previously and leaving their school environment because of social issues. Uh, around 10% say that they enrol to, um, with Bradfield because they're a safe school, and I would uh, suggest that that's probably a lot higher. And in addition to that, around 16% identify as transgender or gender questioning. Again, I would say that that number's probably double. Um, that's the figure that they tell us coming in. So, um, sorry, bear with me. <laughs> Uh, 
So uh, that's the college and we'll move on to the next slide, which uh, tells you a little bit about our journey with the LGB community. And uh, the culture here is really important. So we have um, done some work on something. It was actually came to us via Pullman Hotels, funnily enough. They had a wonderful way of approaching values and cultural principles. It's called Peopleology. So look it up because it's really worth looking at in terms of uh, looking at how to create a culture at your school. And the important thing is that uh, it, it really does talk to who your audience is. It really does talk to who's in your class. And I know talking to educators, um, that's the important thing about being a, a quality teacher. So we acknowledge here that we value and celebrate diversity. And we talk about that and it's in our narrative and everything that we do. Um, we also acknowledge that students, everyone who comes to Bradfield has a story and we have to honor that story. And, and value that story and help to be a part of uh, that their story going forward. Uh, we're respectful and genuine. I think that's in most school uh, mission statements and, and so on, uh, but also that we set clear boundaries and uh, we all make Bradfield. So everything that everybody does every day contributes to making Bradfield. So they are loosely based on peopleology um, and were developed uh, with our school, with all of the students and all of the staff. Uh, so that they truly represented who we are. So around about six years ago, we had started to get a lot of referrals from places like the Gender Centre 2010, also from psychologists and GPs of students who were transitioning or wanted to transition or were gender questioning. Uh, and they came in, in quite a rush. And so it meant that we needed to um, start the learning process very, very quickly about how we needed to respond to these students. So our first step was to do some product, um, some staff professional development with 2010 and Gender Centre. Those two organisations have fantastic resources on their websites. So I highly recommend you go and have a look at them. And it was everything from just understanding the initials and understanding exactly what that meant. The gender unicorn, if you haven't seen, is a fantastic way of uh, really being clear about what some of those uh, initials mean and, and the difference between them. Uh, we were introduced to pronouns, which are sort of old hat now, but at the time they were quite revolutionary. I think a couple of the most important messages for staff were being open to change uh, because these young people are questioning their identity at the time. And so being open to change and allowing that change uh, is, is really important, not locking someone into a particular identity. Um, we have had students change their identity two or three times across the time with us, and that's okay. Um, and also obviously being trans, being LGB is not a choice. And, and I think that was at the time uh, important for a lot of staff to hear. I love this quote from Ziggy, who's one of our gender diverse students who graduated last year. Uh, she said that um, as a gender diverse team, I came from a school that didn't teach in a way that I could grasp. And I never felt as if I fit into the crowd there. But at Bradfield, that all changed. I still don't fit into the crowd. But the difference between now and then is that here, I don't have to fit in. And I think hearing that for us at that graduation speech was really important. We've got a video now that we'll play uh, that um, a couple of our students put together last week. Uh, there's some of our wonderful LGBTQIA plus community, and they put this together to help you understand a little bit of what it's like to be a student at Bradfield. Just a note for everyone, um, there is no sound on the video until the second student sits down. So don't worry about it. There's not a problem with your um, sound. So we'll kick it off. To its culture and it's seen mostly with the fact that we don't have a proper school uniform we can dress however we want and express ourselves however we want so there is a lot of diversity in how people pride themselves and how they dress and how they act in the school because they can be their true self here with the lack of restrictions to uniforms it's also really great that there's no uniform because it helps people express themselves um, in different ways i've 
felt more comfortable not having to wear the uniform and being able to wear my casual whatever I want kind of. It's also just nice because I, I guess you have more independence and like teachers that here understand that as well. I have independence with clothing, I have independence with just like how I study and the fact that the school also is very lenient towards Q dates, like they're a bit easier on you, especially in understanding of mental health. It puts a lot less pressure on me and allows me to do my best without worrying about my mental health. My experience at Bradfield is very different to past school experiences in a very positive way. I feel much more safer and much more accepted for my sexuality, which has helped my um, mental health improve so much more to the point where it's a little weird that I'm not as sad as I used to be, which is also great. Well. Bradfield has supported me through a lot of things. Before Bradfield, I wasn't at a great school. It didn't really help um, support my disabilities that well in class. I am a member of the LGBT plus community and there was a lot of homophobia at my old school. But Bradfield, Bradfield is really supportive uh, with all of that. I don't feel like scared to go to school anymore. I feel safe. I feel I, like I'm thriving and Bradfield has made all of that happen for me. So yes, some of uh, our, our wonderful students there who put that together for uh, the presentation today. One of the other really great things that we learned is, you know, it, diversity of any kind or inclusion of any kind is not about tolerance or acceptance. It is about celebration. And when you can get to celebration, that's when you know that it is truly embedded in your culture. Uh, so we always at our open days talk about being a safe school and talk about having a very strong LGB community and we always hear a sigh of relief uh, when uh, when parents and students hear that because they know that this is a school where they will be supported. Right down from the very um, first point of application where we ask for their pronouns on the application form, which can be a, a point at which they start to have a, a discussion with their parents, that can be a, a nice starting point for them, uh, but it also just shows them that it is something that we care about. Fairly early on, we do an inclusivity survey, and I'm happy to share that um, as part of the resource package that you'll get a little bit later on. Um, it, it's quite complex, so we need to understand for students how they want to be addressed in class, how they want to be um, addressed in front of their parents, and quite often they are very different things. So students sometimes feel safe to come out at the college, but not yet safe enough to come out to their parents. And so having this inclusivity survey helps us to understand the complexity of those arrangements and uh, we can amend all of our systems and so on to make sure that we are using the correct pronouns. Um, we also remove their dead names. So transgender students um, prefer not to use their dead name or their birth name. Uh, and it is quite distressing for them to see their dead name. And so we, we have to go to quite, uh, quite a few lengths to make sure that that doesn't happen for them. And so TAFE, uh, New South Wales, fantastic, diverse and inclusive culture, and they cooperated and worked with us to uh, remove those dead names because it was actually a barrier for them during COVID to actually logging in to their team sessions because they had to log in with their dead name. And so they just refused to, uh, to do any work. So that was a really important one for us. We also ask them whether they want two school reports. So generally, we, we for our um, gender questioning and transgender students, we always provide one in their birth name for legal and family re reasons, but we also provide one in their preferred name. Um, on the first day of orientation, you can see uh, one of our students there holding up their badge. We do pronoun badge making. So this is great, for, again, for the LGB students because, again, they know straight away that they're accepted. But it's also a really important exercise for our non-LGB students because uh, they start to understand how important that is to the culture that they're about to come into. Um, of course, we have all of the celebration days. So we're at Purple Day there, Ida Hobbit Day, uh, absolutely important. And in the bottom right there, you can see a picture of me in 2020. This was just one week prior to uh, lockdown, um, where I marched down Oxford Street as an ally with our LGBTQIA plus students in the Mardi Gras as part of the TAFE New South Wales float. And I have to say that was probably one of my proudest days uh, to be able to do that. It was pretty fun being part of Mardi Gras. Um, but 
a student lady came up to me and said that was for them one of the most profound things that had happened to them because it made them feel absolutely and utterly valid that their principal would uh, walk with them as part of a, a gay parade. We have our lunchtime clubs, which is, you know, the usual uh, Dungeons and Dragons and digital creatives and poetry and so on. And gender diversity is one of those clubs where uh, anyone can come along and uh, discuss issues around gender and they can learn and also share in a safe um, environment. Um, importantly, we, we did lose a student, a trans student, a couple of years ago, and um, at this point I you know, have to say the resources of BU and Headspace were absolutely critical. We felt so supported by them and the framework that they put in place for us to help us deal with that. Um, and they are a, a really, truly wonderful team. Uh, so each year we do uh, honour the Trans Day of Remem Remembrance with a vigil. Uh, we've brought in guest speakers uh, and a wonderful doula from Sydney who talked about um, Trans Day of Remembrance and helped students to really understand the importance of that day as well. So it is about celebration. It's about embedding it in community alongside all of the other celebrations that we have at the college. And I think that's really how uh, we have developed a, a culture where our LGBTQIA plus students and parents feel um, truly connected to the college. Thank you. Thanks so much, Meredith. We are going to go into our panel discussions. I'm going to turn off my sharing so we can hopefully see everyone. Can we get Kirstine and that's all of us. Beautiful. Great. I just want to say a quick thank you, Aislinn, because I could really hear some clear actions that schools that are in the early stages of um, creating whole school improvement around inclusive practice or wellbeing could really latch on to through both what Kirstine and Meredith said. So thank you. Yes, it's been really fantastic. And um, as there has been a little reminder in the chat, don't forget to send through any questions you have for any of the people on the panel today through that Q&A box. Um, we may not get to them today, but we will be able to take some of them on notice and send them in our various documents after the fact. So very excited. This is my favourite part of any of these webinars is getting to have a good chat. Um, first off, I just wanted to have a bit of a quick chat with Meredith. So we've talked a lot about creating safety for students. And I'm just wondering if any of those processes might be similar or different when we're looking at safe culture for staff. And I ask that because we did have a question come through around teacher diversity and how to support staff to feel included and understood. Well, I, I think it goes back to the, um, the the values. Everyone is valued here, and we do have um, a wonderful uh, LGB teacher community and um, and a trans teacher who uh, helps lead some of our programs. And again, uh, there's some pretty um, disturbing stats out there about. Uh, the um, employability of trans people, uh, which um, one of our, my trans teacher uh, shared with me recently. And so it's just so important for our students to see that we have a trans teacher on staff and that um, seeking employment, getting employment is possible. Uh, and so look, all of this applies to both staff and students. It's a very equal kind of environment that we have here. Um, and so staff know that they, and, and again, we have pictures, uh, posters up from Gender Centre in 2010 all around the school that indicate to anyone who comes in that this is a safe place for anyone who comes in here. Thank you for sharing that, Meredith. I can really hear from what you're saying that the visibility of wellbeing for all and also visibility of diversity between students and staff has really empowered your community. Um, I now have a question for Kirstine. And Kirstine, this is uh, speaking to some questions that were raised by our attendees around uh, school cultures that are perhaps resistant to change or struggle through the process of change. So my question is, how do we implement change in schools that are resistant to change? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really great question. And, you know, I'd, I'd say um, it's really important to meet people where they're at um, and to, to help engage, um, you know, if we're talking about staff, for example, to help 
or, or parents and carers for that matter, um, it, engage them in the process so that they feel like they've been part of that process. Um, I know I've had um, just recently a, a deputy principal talking to me about um, facing this issue within uh, their school and they found by you know really taking the staff and parent um, care community um, through the steps along with the admin team made a critical difference because um, it helped to um, give them some of the information and education they were needing too. Everyone's got different starting points on their learning journeys around inclusion. So um, it's really important to recognise that and provide those opportunities for that education and, and that um, opportunity for learning growth to occur. Um, but then by involving them in each um, stage, giving them a chance to have input into what was being developed, it really helped to get them to um, have buy-in uh, to, to the process, um, which then got them uh, understanding why it was important and being actively engaged in trying to help be part of a positive solution in, in creating an inclusive culture. So um, so hopefully that gives <laughs> some some uh, ideas on, on a way to approach that. Yes, thank you so much, Kirstine. And I really love that piece about taking people along on the journey with you um, and helping people to find their their own sense of ownership in the change that's having to happen. Um, and I think that leadership can be so important in that space. Um, and so one of the other themes that came through was around, I guess, that modelling of inclusive practice. And Meredith, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how uh, teachers, educators, leaders could model that inclusive practice for those around them? Well, I think as was, has, has already been mentioned, visibility is really important and being seen to support uh, the initiatives as they come through, you know, the, the celebration days and so on is really important. To be there for the training and to be there uh, to, to allow people to come and, and speak to you at any time about any of the matters that come up um, that, that uh, you know, can, can just take a little while for people to, to take a grasp of. I know we, I, th I think our journey was quite rapid uh, because it had to be because that we, we had so many students come so quickly really. Um, and so that people really needed to get on board very quickly, uh, but they made mistakes. So, you know, mis misgendering happens. Um, our wonderful trans teacher says that he often misgenders himself. Um, so, it, it, and it is about saying this is not about you and the mistake that you've made over pronouns. This is actually, um, you know, you, you apologize and move on and don't make a big deal out of it uh, because that was what was happening in the beginning. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have I've done it again. No, no, no. This is actually not about you. Just apologize and move on. So, modeling those types of things so that people can see you are genuine about it. It's not just something that you're doing because it's a flavor of the month, um, modelling it and doing it every single day and every single interaction with, with uh, everybody from staff to students, I think is the most important thing. That's great advice and so reaffirming because sometimes we shy away from those conversations or that ability to truly connect with an individual student because we might make a mistake. So I really appreciate what you had to say there, Meredith. The next theme that come through from our attendees was about uh, parent and carer connection with diverse groups of young people and the need for parents to have information and support so that they can do better to guide their own young people at home. Um, and perhaps um, to touch on how we empower parents and how do we bring them along the journey um, to be included in some of those safety messages that are occurring in the school environment. So this next question I have is for Kirstine. Um, how can parents reflect what young people are learning at school around diversity and inclusion? Um, in, in terms of reflecting it at home or um, involving them within the school community? Yeah, I think it's um, more about how they, um, if, if students consider the school environment a safe place to express their true identity, and perhaps in the home environment, they may not feel this and, and parents want to make a change themselves, yeah. how can they, they reflect what journey they're going on to be supportive of their young people at home? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and um, this does come up <laughs> in, in my line of work. And, and I know sometimes parents and carers can feel quite upset, for example, if they find out that 
um, their child has felt comfortable to talk about their gender identity or sexuality at school, but hasn't felt comfortable um, in disclosing that information to their parents and carers first. So I think it's really important that um, we, first of all, if that sort of situation has occurred, reassure parents and carers that actually disclosing identity to family and parents and carers in particular can be the hardest thing that a young uh, gender diverse or, um, you know, sexuality diverse young person ever needs to do. Um, so it's not a necessarily a personal reflection of them. Um, it's just that, um, you know, that's who a young person probably cares about more in the whole world. So it, it can be really scary for young people to, um, feel confident in, in having that conversation. Um, so there are things that parents and carers can do if they are wanting to signpost to their young person that um, they are open to LGBTIQ plus people and, and supportive um, of diversity. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's the little things. It's how you respond if... Um, you know, there's an LGBTIQ plus person on the TV, or it's how you respond if something negative is is shown or, or said, or if there's a homophobic or transphobic joke or comment made, it's showing that, you know, you don't agree with that. You actually are, um, you know, supportive and inclusive of LGBTIQ plus people. Um, it's establishing open communication as well with children um, right from a very early age. Um, I, I know I've overheard a conversation between a, a parent and her daughter once just being out in public, and it was um, talking about when she gets older and and perhaps meet someone that she'd like to date and how the mother didn't mind if it was a boy or a girl or somebody else as long as she was happy so it's sending those clear messages um, right from the early age so that um, hopefully by the time that the child becomes aware of their diverse gender or sexuality they um, will then uh already be well aware that um their parents or carers are going to be open and receptive to that Definitely, those little signposts on the way are so fantastic. I could absolutely chat with the three of you all day, but I am just very mindful of the time. So I will get back into our presentation. Um, Katie and I have a few little resources to whip through quickly so that we can let everyone go on time. But thank you again so much, Meredith and Kirstine. It's been so wonderful chatting with you today. So let's hope that it all goes well with me sharing back up again. And we are going to just very quickly have a little bit more very brief conversation because I do want to touch on this concept and Katie has a really wonderful story about it. But this idea of being comfortable in that space of discomfort, and I think Meredith mentioned as well, understanding that it's people make mistakes and people make errors, but it's not necessarily about us. It's about being supportive and finding ways to acknowledge it, apologise and move on, um, but not being too afraid to be in the space. So Katie, um, would you like to share your little story just very quickly? It's perhaps not a story, but it's it's more about the vulnerability of going back to my early teaching career and perhaps thinking I'm not the expert or not the right person to step in the space to have the connection with the young person, but could obviously see that they needed extra support and help and the courage that it takes to be the person of white privilege perhaps or the person that doesn't come from a, a diverse gender identity or LGBTQIA+, but the teacher that has courage to go into a conversation to gently inquire and to maybe consider what aspects do make us feel uncomfortable and seek support as educators to then be able to manage the discomfort so we are providing unbiased support to our young people. So um, to consider um, what sorts of things have gotten in the way for you in the, in the past to giving open and honest and genuine positive regard to young people and building those relationships um, to consider um, aspects of you know racism discrimination and your experiences of those things in the past which may have caused you trauma that could impact on your dialogue with that young person and also to think about whether you've held on to information uh, rather than having the courage to escalate or share 
um, and just to really reflect on your own barriers and seek help and support and maybe lean into some of those BU resources that we'll mention in a moment to give you the courage and empowerment to do so. That's absolutely fantastic, Katie. And I really want to thank you for being able to have that vulnerability to share the space that you've been working from in the past. And I think today we've spoken quite a bit about risk factors. We've spoken a little bit about protective factors as well. Um, we've got some of them on the screen at the moment, but um, I guess some of the things to think about in this space is that risk factors tend to be um, things that can be quite stable over time and things that can be quite difficult to impact. But where we can really make a huge difference for the other people in our lives is in this protective factors space. And in the protective factors space, you'll see that a lot of those have really good relevance to the school community and the school climate. So we're teaching those social emotional skills, we're connecting in with families, we're enhancing that school climate. And as educators, quite often you can be that caring adult that provides support at those critical times and connections to community. So it's really exciting um, to be in that position, to be able to support the people around us, to be able to um, enhance their protection. Um, and so bearing that in mind, we have a little bit of audience interaction here so if you just want to scan the little QR code there or you can also join at slido.com with the little code what we would love from you is a couple of examples of protective factors that you have seen within your school environment that can support inclusion for your students Oh, I can see some responses coming in. So we've got 122 exciting. participants that I can see. So I'm expecting a, a lot of answers here, Aislinn. Yeah, hopefully. So hopefully you've that. got your mobile devices out and you're scanning the QR code. I really like that one there that I'm going to spotlight. Using gender neutral terms, it's so difficult to get out of the habit of saying, hey guys, <laughs> um, that's been one of my big challenges on my own journey. Um, so I love seeing that one in there. Empathy, look at that, getting bigger and bigger every time. And that's really is, really is key. Any that you're seeing in there, Katie, that you yeah, really I love? Yeah, I saw a few around. Um when uh, students are feeling disconnected or vulnerable, that opportunity to go to a safe space, to have quiet time, or then the next step to actually have a check-in with a trusted person within the school. Um, and I can see a really important one there too, student voice. So mm -hmm. in what ways are we getting students actively involved in our school procedures, our policies, or creation of school events to be more inclusive? Fantastic. Now, I do have to move off of this beautiful word cloud because we are running out of time very rapidly, but keep coming, keep sending them through because they will keep coming to us and loving to see everything that's coming through. So thank you so much, everyone. So BU has five professional learning domains for educators. And for today's session, we're really gonna shine a light on the early support domain. So the early support domain helps educators understand and improve knowledge about mental health and wellbeing and teaches them the skills to know how to inquire about a young person and how they're going and when and how to access supports for that young person as well. At the end of this session, you'll be provided with a link to be able to assist you to connect with your school's BU consultant. So if you'd like to learn more about the early support domain, you can um, or attend a future early support uh, BU Spotlight session. One of the best tools that comes as part of the early support domain is the Beatles Observation Tool. That stands for Behaviour, Emotion, Thoughts, Learning and Social Relationships Observation Tool. This is a fantastic tool to empower teachers to identify the early signs of mental illness and to record and document what they're observing. 
And in doing so, they can share this information with the wellbeing team or with specialists in, internal to the school or external to the school that may be needed to support a young person. And it's also super helpful to have there as a tool to refer back to, to empower educators to have those uh, delicate conversations with parents and carers about the young people as well. So what can we take away from today? Some of those really important key messages. Um, it's okay to make mistakes and feel vulnerable as an educator and that you're not an expert potentially of LGBTQIA plus or First Nations young people, but it's important to be aware and to know that curiosity is caring. Uh, don't feel that you need to walk on eggshells and, um, and to have the courage to walk into the space of engaging and caring for that young person. Potentially to lean into some of the resources just mentioned through the BU Early Support Domain and build your capacity around those skills. Um, and also uh, consider connecting students with appropriate community services to their needs. Um, and think about what it's like to come together as a whole staff uh, with a whole school improvement plan for wellbeing and to have staff and student involvement around active planning for inclusive practice within your school communities too. When Katie was mentioning understanding what supports you can connect up your students to, um, just wanted to highlight some of these groups. Some of them are national organisations, some of them are only in specific regions or states or territories. Um, but the evidence that we have access to shows that young people are more likely to rate support services as being helpful when they're a support service that's tailored or dedicated to the experiences that that young person has had in their life. So um, whether that's LGBTIQ plus specific organisations, uh, First Nations organisations, or places like the Refugee Council, the Migrant Resource Centre for people who have um, come from a migrant or refugee background. So Moving on from here, and we might just squeeze in under our uh, under our finish time. Um, let's really try and keep these conversations happening. Have a chat with your co colleagues. Talk to your students about it. Um, like Katie said, get in touch with your BU consultant and talk about some of our resources and planning that we can do. Uh, Utilise those resources. Think about implementing some of the strategies that our panelists today mentioned. There were some fantastic ideas. Uh, celebrate diversity and we would love for you to share your story with us um, because we always love to hear from educators and school communities about what they're doing and how they're working in these spaces. Uh, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. As we head toward the end of the session, I invite you all to participate in a short survey. We not only appreciate and value your feedback, but we'd also like to hear from you some ideas for future directions or themes our in-focus sessions could take. Please see in the chat a survey link. So BU Framework offers so much helpful information and resources. Um, the main thing is to sign up and register for BU and to seek guidance from your consultant because there's so much there. Today we highlighted the BU professional learning domains. One particular domain uh, was the early support domain and in association with that we have tools and guides. So it was the Beatles observation tool that we mentioned today and also to remember that we have a range of fact sheets and handbooks to guide you at any step of the journey when you're talking about whole school improvement for your community. This slide just highlights some of the national supports available. Um, this graphic is also available on the BU website as a PDF um, and can be really useful for sharing with your broader school community to make sure that people have access to some of those support numbers. Um, you're also more than welcome to note some of these down if you're feeling like you wanna reach out and access support for yourself as well. That's a really good one to help normalise help seeking mm -hmm. in your school. So put it in conference rooms where you have yep. regular parent care meetings with young people, email it out at the end of the term before a holiday period and just really normalise that idea of anyone can reach out for support for their own mental health and wellbeing within your school community.
Um, we also have a couple of other sessions and events coming up. They're a bit more interactive than today was. So if you do come along to those ones, be prepared to have a bit of a chat with the presenters. So we've got a spotlight on the mental health continuum and the notice, inquire and provide model coming up on the 21st. And then on the 1st of December, there is a conversation around leading mental health work in schools. So that is us for this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming along. We really, really appreciate everyone coming and learning with us today. I've learned so much today as well. Um, so thanks so much and we would love to hear from you soon.